So um, first I want to quickly uh, introduce myself. My name is Christoph. I started in 2016 as a postdoc in Jürgen Cox's lab. And my first week um, was in Oxford at the summer school. Um, that was a great start. And um, the next year I was part of the organizing team. We went to Berlin. The year after that, we went to Barcelona. And it was always a lot of fun to organize this event. And it's a very special event because somehow the like size, always around 200 people combined with very nice locations. And we always try to also get some good food. Um, comes together to make a very good experience. So I really hope you enjoy it. And I will talk about uh, quantification. So you've heard a lot about identifications uh, up to now, but not that much about quantification. So quantification. Um, so when you conducted an experiment, you usually uh, end up with such a matrix. So you have uh, several samples. You measured several samples. Uh, in this case, we have n samples. And there are protein groups, uh, which are quantified usually you have much more proteins than you have samples. And uh, in this table, there should be intensities um, of these uh, protein groups within samples. So the sample types can vary a lot. Um, that can be time points, that can be patients, and many, many more experimental designs, uh, which is mainly uh, your responsibility. So. Um, these measurements, of course, they they are like they have a dynamic range, which is, which is somehow um, limited. Sometimes you have um, missing values, and the concentrations are a little, little bit modulated by noise. So it's not inherently quantitative this mass spec data. But let's continue with this matrix. Um, now it's blue. We see it here. So we again have our samples, and we have the proteins. So there is um, two types of quantification we can now do, right? We can do a relative quantification, which means we compare the quantity of the proteins across the samples. Looking at that table, so for example, we uh, compare protein three uh, over all these samples, but there's also uh, the possibility to do an absolute quantification, which would mean that um, we compare like the pro, uh, like only we only look at one sample and uh, have a look at the quantities of protein within this sample. So uh, I'll talk about relative quantification in this talk, and um, there is several ways to do it. You've already heard about uh, MS1 labeling. There is methods like Silac or others. There is uh, MS2 labeling using TMT or others. And there's also label-free. Um, and this is what I'm talking about. Uh, label-free, LFQ is the title. So um, the label-free is already in the title. And I'm mainly talking about uh, this paper, the Max LFQ paper from 2014. Um, and this uh, Max LFQ is included in Max Quant. It's uh, widely used. And it since um, since recently, la last year, was it last year? Yes. Um, it's not only working for DDA data, but also for DIA data. Um, I'm talking about DDA today, um, and tomorrow Jürgen will explain you how it works in DIA. And um, so label-free quantification has many advantages. So the samples are all equal, right? You, you don't have to do any, um, any labeling, so you don't have batch effects. Uh, it's not like that you, you have to order and you have to pay for, for some like tags um, or even um, do um, um, Silac. And um, this is less effort in the sample preparation. Um, also, the peptides are really chemically identical. And you have a, since you don't add any additional complexity, you also have a high dynamic range in your data. OK, so you should use label free. Thank you very much. 
Um, but of course, uh, there's always some challenges and there is many challenges which I talk about. I don't want to call it problems because it, they're all solved. So you, you can relax. Um, but let's have a closer look. Um, and let's just compare again Silac, um, where, where you have only one run and you have a, a heavy and a light version of a peptide. So here we see the isotope patterns and they have a specific uh, mass to charge difference. And this can be used for quantification. Very easy. Um, in the other case, in label three, we have, we need two runs. Um, so we don't compare within one run, but we compare between two of them. And this is not as easy as it looks. Um, why? For example, the elution times of these peptides, they differ between runs. So it's very, very hard to find, uh, to have a, a stable chromatography and it will never be like perfectly reproducible. So you have these shifts in retention time. You have when you do DDA, you go top N, right? And like the amount of um, material can change, can vary, even if you do technical replicates. So that means that uh, the precursors selected for fragmentation are not always the same. So that you get some identifications in one run and slightly different ones in the other one. Um, also the intensities can change as I already mentioned. And if you do pre-fractionation, then these peptides, they don't only appear in one fraction, no, they can appear in two or even more. So um, let's start with the illusion time problem. In this very nice plot, we see on the x-axis the retention time of identified peptides in one SCMS run. And here we see the difference of these same identified peptides in another run. So as we can see, uh, if they would be perfectly aligned, that should be, they should all be here at zero and have no difference but uh, we have a different picture. So there is some areas which are uh, sparse like this one, and there's this very high dense area. So it looks like there is a global trend, right? Like they're all shifted um, in one direction, but not, there's, it's not an offset over the whole run, it's changing over time. So um, to, to get rid of that problem um, in, in the max LFQ, there is uh, this alignment function. So this data is taken and there is a function um, fitted to this data, which um, actually can um, model this behavior and can then be subtracted from, from these differences leading to a distribution around zero. Um, so, this is another representation by just plotting the retention times against each other, a so-called correlation plot. And uh, this leads to very nice correlations um, between two samples. And since we do LFQ, we can have as many samples as we want. And this is performed pairwise between all of them. And this can be displayed in such a huge matrix. Let's start again, a uh, new representation. We have this so-called LCMS map here between run one and run two, and uh, they are shifted, the retention times as you see, and this is now fixed. So now we can compare. We can compare peptides which are identified in both ones, but in this case, it's more complicated. So this green isotope pattern we can see here, that was selected for fragmentation. So we have a PSM, an identification, but in the other run, it's not. I mean, there is a pattern. Um, it looks very similar, but we don't know. We don't have to fragment. Um, but since they are perfectly aligned, these runs, um, in retention time and also, um, the, the master charge uh, should be very close to each other. This identification can be transferred from one run to the other one. And this idea is very nice because by that you can really boost the comparability. So the number of um, comparable features can go up to 100%. Um, 
and this matching is actually required in, in LFQ. Okay, yes, this arrow just shows what I just explained. Um, okay, good. Let's continue with the challenges. Um, there is the normalization. Um, so, as I said, the intensities vary and um, it's kind of difficult to compare intensities between samples. And I, I, li I like this, uh, this image here. So if you would uh, like not look at the background and compare the, the left red person here to the right one, and someone asks you which one is taller, you would say the right one. But when you look at the background, um, then you have an assumption that, okay, these people, they won't be all taller. So probably um, you should normalize it and then compare the intensities to each other. This is the normalization. And I also explained the uh, prefractionation um, quickly before we come to the normalization we needed there. So, um, as I said, these peptides, they, uh, they don't only elude in, in one um, fraction, but in several runs. So that means like one sample corresponds to multiple LCMS runs. And um, this uh, also has to be um, taken into account because we know um, like these runs are also not really comparable between each other because there is this inherent uh, variation in uh, in the retention times and intensities. So the uh, procedure is a little bit complicated and we should start with the peptide intensity. So we have a peptide P and the peptide is yellow. Um, so in this table, we, we see uh, we have a, a sample, we have three samples in sample A. This peptide TP is present and we have it in fraction five, six, and seven. And um, in sample B, um, it's also there, but it's not the same fractions, also three. And in sample C, it's only two. Ay, 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 ay. Okay, but let's start with the intensity. So what's the intensity? Uh, the naive way would be, okay, we just take the um, intensities from all the fractions. So we're now talking about peptide P in sample A. So we just sum them up. Um, that would be naive because we know all the problems. Um, then the general way would be, okay, um, we know that the intensities vary. So we apply some normalization factors. We have these products between the intensities and we have a normalization factor for every SCMS run means sample A fraction five has its own normalization factor. And we can like collect them in this matrix. Um, why is there the, all these X's? I'll explain you later. So, and then we can continue and, and like write down formulas for these intensities for peptides. Okay. Um, there's another peptide. It's the green one. Um, it's peptide Q, and we can apply the same formula to these intensities, applying the same normalization factors, which again belong to each single SCMS run. Okay, this is very cool. So we can calculate them now uh, if we would know the uh, normalization factors, which should be here in this matrix, but we don't know them. So they are unknown and uh, the solution is, um, it's very elegant. Um, so there is in the max LFQ, there is this function H defined, which takes the squared logarithms of the ratios of the peptides between samples. And this uh, overall peptides and uh, fractions. So, and this function is then minimized by varying the normalization factor. So we're finding the optimal normalization factors, which lead to the minimum of that function. And the minimum of that function is actually that they are the intensities of all peptides. Um, these uh, fractions are all one. So that means 
the assumption is the overall intensity between two samples is not changing. Most of the peptides ha have the same intensity like these people. These people, where well, we assume most of them, they just stay the same and they're not affected by the conditions we apply to these samples we compare. So first, they were not comparable, doing all this nice math and getting all these factors leads to a normalization which makes them now comparable. The peptide intensities. But we're talking about protein quantification, right? Um, and the peptide is not yet a protein. So let's have a look at the protein. Um, so this protein here, P63, blah, blah, it has uh, seven peptides, uh, which were somehow identified in our runs. And um, this can be displayed again in a, in a nice table. So we have uh, several samples and these peptides all belonging to one protein group. Um, they were, um, they are listed here, they could be uh, quantified and have, an, uh, have a value. Um, so to do relative protein quantification, the idea is to do pairwise comparisons of these uh, peptides between the samples. And if you do pairwise, you end up with a rectangular matrix. So the, um, the ratios uh, bit of, the, of the peptides um, between two, for example, A and B, um, A and B, uh, we, have, we have two common uh, peptides and then these, uh, these ratios are just calculated and they end up um, in this RBA value. So it, um, this is the median actually, if you have several of them. And then this matrix can be filled up to a certain degree, but not all of them uh, are really comparable because you just don't have uh, these comparable peptides. Um, there is a um, so-called minimum ratio count that um, is set to two normally. So that means that, for example, these two samples, E and F, they only have uh, this one um, ratio and that's just not enough. Um, so in, in that case, um, it's not calculated like this. Um, but using these ratios, oh yes, here you have the formula, um, you can then calculate an LFQ intensity profile, which is relative, very important. And for example, um, here in this is, um, this is our, our problem, right? Uh, F is just not comparable to these others. There is the so-called stabilized large ratios, so it could just be that F is like very, very low intense and that you would mean it's a large ratio. Um, it's also generally for large ratios, um, the case. So then in, in, that, uh, in that case, uh, there is another idea. So it's just summing up the uh, intensities of the peptides and taking the ratio of this one. Let's do some benchmarking. Okay, so we start with like small ratios. Uh, so we like compare or we expect or probably even know that the ratio is not uh, not very huge. So they are, okay, we would say they are like there's a huge difference, but uh, to me that's not a huge difference between these two guys. So such a benchmarking experiment in the paper was a uh, mixing experiment. There was HeLa. Um, background and E. coli spike into it in a one-to-one -one ratio in one case and in a one-to-three ratio in the other case. And I personally really like these experiments because you like you, you mix it together, you know what's inside and then the challenge is to actually figure out, like find it back in the data, like doing mass back and like max plant and all these very, very complicated technologies. And um, so this is the, the, the results where we see like the log two distributions um, of the intensities. And in, in this case, that was 2014, it was benchmarked 
to the state of the art at that time, uh, which was a method called like spectral counting and, and also compared to uh, some intensities. And when you look at the distributions here, and then you you get um, the, the can you you get the ratios, and it shows that this value is actually the log two of the spike in ratio. So it's uh, it works very very nicely and much better than the other tools. And this was uh, also confirmed by the Gigi Lab um, in 2018. I mean, it was confirmed many times, but this is a nice example. They use TMT, um, these isobaric labels, which uh, Habib will talk about tomorrow. And uh, also there, it, uh, it was shown that the LFQ is very, very um, accurate. Uh, also, like compared to TMT, um, it's yeah, it's the actually the better. So we talked about small ratios. Uh, there was another experiment um, about large ratios. So the, in that case, the, the benchmark was done with the, these UPS1 and UPS2 standards, uh, which have like um, human proteins, 80, uh, 48 uh, human proteins, and they were spiked in with a different with different amounts and the factor it was always a factor of 10 in abundance and here you can see again the, the in this case the log 10 so you, you can see okay it's like always like tenfold um you see you see the background around zero which should be one to one right that's how the lfq works it sets it to one and when you take the log um, and then you you can see the different um, the different abundance differences that were spiked in. You find it very very nicely in this analysis. Okay, um, I think we solved all the problems, um, the challenges. There is another thing I want to talk about which is not part of the max lfq in in max quant but it's uh, the missing values problem so in this figure we we compare these uh, these samples to each other with different uh, conditions and the, the, this shows the unmatched like without matching between runs so where we have much less uh, peptides uh, which are actually comparable between between the samples and um the the gray areas they are bad right because this is like always um, missing missing data missing values and there is a lot of gray um so the the matching and i i like told you before and here we can uh, impressively see that it fills up a lot of this gray area so we make them more much more comparable by um taking the identifications and um after alignment, applying them to um, to the other samples. Okay, um, but there is still some gray, um, and this means that well, probably couldn't be measured, but it's very likely that um, it could be measured because there, it has a low abundance. This protein is just depleted, um, or gen general like very low abundance. And the statistical method to uh, encounter that problem is to to um, impute values. So um, these blue values here, they are imputed. That means we assume they this, these proteins, they are there. Um, we just couldn't measure them, but they should be low abundant. And therefore, we just give them very small numbers. And to do it statistically correct, we just don't set it to zero or constant value, but we impute by taking um, taking a, a distribution here, a Gaussian distribution um, at the, the lower part of the intensity histogram and taking just samples from, from there. So that's how the uh, missing values problem is solved. And uh, this is done in Precious. Back to the beginning, this is our matrix. So I talked about uh, relative um, quantification with max LFQ. There is also absolute quantification. There's a tool, the proteomic ruler, which you can find in, in Perseus. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about that today. Um, 
And that's it. Thank you for your attention.